So, what I am going to do is I am just going to start with the recall. This session is done in a very first day to see what type of questions are asked, from where it is asked, which book the reference is taken line to line. So, that is very very important for a student even before he starts actual preparation. So, that is what I am going to do today. Let us get started. So, every question you will type alphabet and to say what is an answer. What is the grade of Clavin Dindo classification for infected wound opened at a bedside? So, the right answer for this question is grade 1. Now, where is this taken from? So, this is taken from Bailey and Love, 28th edition, page number 318. Okay. Now, you look into the table number 24.1 okay? and if any corrections or any problem that you are not convinced with my answer, you can definitely tell me and we can have a discussion on that in case it is to be the other way, I will tell you this the other way, it is not that, then we can take an other way. So, grade 1, any deviation from the normal post-operative course without the need for pharmacological treatment or surgical or endoscopic or radiological intervention. Next. Acceptable therapeutic regimens as drugs as antiemetics, antipyretics, analgesics, diuretics, electrolytes and physiotherapy. This grade also includes wound infection, wound infection opened out of the bedside. So, grade 2 requiring pharmacological treatment with drugs other than such allowed for grade 1 complications, blood transfusions, total parental nutrition are also included. Grade 3 requiring surgical, endoscopic or radiological intervention. Grade 3A intervention not under GA. Okay. Grade 3B intervention under GA. So, this is also potential MCQ. Grade 3B is an exam question also. So, they will ask you intervention requiring general anesthesia. One of the popular question which has happened two times in last five years in various exams. Okay, this is a very, very important table for exams. And four, life threatening complication including CNS complication, example, brain hemorrhage, but excluding TAS and requiring SU management. In that subclassification, 4A, single organ dysfunction, including dialysis, 4B, multi organ dysfunction. So, this also should be expected in upcoming exam. So, according to Clevin Dindo classification, Multi organ dysfunction, MODS will be stage 4 in subclassification stage 4B and they do not ask the extreme end death of the patient as 5 because most of them know the grade 4 or grade 5 is the maximum that is the death. Understood? So, wound infection open on the bedside, grade 1. Is it clear? Now, I am just giving you a clinical scenario. A patient has undergone a CABG, undergone a CABG, immediate post-operative period, post-op, falling BP, hypertension, drain, ICD nil. Intercostal drainage tube, there is a nil collection, there is nothing coming out. Patient in ICU, what is the next step? What do you expect? What is the clinical diagnosis? Cardiac tamponade. Now, for cardiac tamponade, you have to reopen. Where you will reopen? Where you will reopen? Will you shift the patient to the theater? You will reopen on the correct bedside. So, you will cut all the sternal wire and you will open up and you will just see is it cardiac tamponade and you remove all the clots and arrest the bleeding 
and stabilize the patient. So, this is a bedside reopening. Next case, similar appearing questions, what they can be asked. The patient comes to you with a large diaphragmatic hernia, postrolateral bogdalic type of hernia and the patient had a repair, a surgical repair where the predominant the spleen, stomach, small intestine, transverse colon, everything was there in the thorax that was reduced and a mesh was kept on the diaphragmatic side and was repaired. Post-op, O1, abdomen distended, number 2, BP is falling, number 3, urine output is falling, patient is in tacky. Next step, is to pressure, measure the bladder pressure. Correct? Hello. So, we are working on a suspicion of a abdominal compartmental syndrome. Correct? Abdominal compartmental syndrome. See, these classes are meant to enjoy. These classes are meant to acquire knowledge systematically, point wise, precisely and to be applied out of the exams. Okay? Every day you will learn something. Yes? Happily you will learn. It is not that you will force yourself to do something, nothing. You will thoroughly enjoy. Each and every class you will enjoy. Okay? Do not force yourself to come to the class. You will be affected towards the class. <laughs> okay? Yes. So, next step is to measure the bladder. How do you measure the bladder pressure? You can put it in a in the Foley's catheter, you will put it in the saline tube inside. Yes? And make it straight and take a scale and measure the what is the ratio of level of urine and you will measure is it 10 centimeter or 15 centimeter or 25 centimeter IV set catheter, correct? Okay. Now, what centimeter of pressure will alarm you? What centimeter of measurement of pressure will alarm you? Okay. We are dealing with the abdominal compartmental syndrome. This patient has to be immediately intervened. See, anything more than 20 is suspicious, but more than 25 is alarming. You should start intervening. 25 is the cutoff number. Understood? And you have to reopen. Yes? Where will you reopen? What will you do next? You will have to open up in the ICU bed or you will shift him to the theatre and do it. You will shift him to the OT and do in a controlled, in a controlled environment. It is not like the heart that you open on the ICU. It is a controlled environment and you can handle it. But abdomen is not that way. Abdomen is not that way. Okay? Because the patient will also not collapse. He will be deteriorating, but he will not collapse. Cardiac, he will die. If you do not open on the table in the ICU, on the bed, he will die. So, it will give you some time. This abdominal compartment syndrome is gradually progressing. So, it will give you some time. So, you can shift to the theatre and open up all the switches. The minute you open all the switches, what is that you expect immediate? What is the immediate sign you will expect? Have you done these cases? If you have done these cases, what you have observed? The minute you open up the abdomen, the BP will increase, man. The BP will increase. A normal BP will come up. Good urine output will be there. Good urine output. And if <laughs> there is few ml of urine in the euro bag, you will see 1.5 to 2 liters of urine immediately. Because the compression would have first gone to the renal perfusion and compression of the ureters. And the venous return on the IVC. So, those ones relieved, a good BP and good urine output will be there. You will be a very happy person. 
But the BP, which is almost 90-60 or 80-60, will shoot up 110-80, 120-90, something like that. Then immediately you will have, immediately you will have a good urine output. Both are related only, but slightly there is a difference between abdominal compartmental syndrome and abdominal hypertension. There is a slight difference is there and we will discuss it. This is totally a topic by itself. We will discuss it when we deal with that. Okay. Here, our concern is to discuss which all we are going to open on the table or on the theatre or similar conditions. Is it okay? Right. So, once you open up and you will put a, a silastic phlegm and a pack to cover and if you require lateral abdominal release to increase the abdominal capacity can be done and patient can be shifted. Okay. So, this is at another aspect that you will know and you will always understand the management of ICU to read the ABG, we will have a class on ABG. How to interpret ABG is very, very important. So, the bedside techniques, ABG is one of the important techniques, ventilator setups are important techniques that one should know. Okay. Not a component of revised cardiac risk index, these are the actual questions which are asked in INESS normal general surgery. What is your answer? The right answer for this question is hypertension. Now, Bailey and Lau, 20th edition, page number 296. When you see the risk factors, history of ischemic heart disease, history of compensated or prior heart failure, history of cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, renal insufficiency, high risk of surgery. The risk of major cardiac complications is a number of factors. So, all these are given with the numerical values, you can go through it. But these are the components of revised cardiac risk index of Lee. And when you look into the question where you have diabetes, renal insufficiency and history of stroke where hypertension is not a part of the revised cardiac risk index. Is it okay? Clear for all of you? So, this is straight factual question from a table from Paley and Lau. Is it okay? Surgical classification of old traumatic wound. Old traumatic wound. See, this is a must question. There are few questions which will be there in every paper. This is one such question. Classification of wounds is a sure short question asked in every paper. Again, this is also a factual question and the right answer is class 4 as you all rightly said. See, let us finish the class 4 first. It is a dirty wound. It is class 4 is dirty wound. Old traumatic wound. See that? Old traumatic wounds with the retained devitalized tissue and those that involve the existing clinical infection or perforated viscera. So, this is class 4 dirty wound. Look into the rest of the class like clean, clean contaminated and contaminated and dirty. This is how it is. Clean wound is an uninfected operative wound. No inflammation is encountered. Respiratory, elementary, genital are uninfected. Urinary tracts are not entered. And primary post and if necessary drained using a closed system. So, this is clean wound. And like a case of a hernia surgery, it is a classical example. Breast biopsy, classical example. Clean contaminated, where respiratory, elementary, genital or urinary tracts are entered under the control conditions and without an unusual contamination. No evidence of infection or major breakthrough technique is encountered. There is clean contaminated. Okay. Where class 3 is a contaminated. Now, you tell me appendicectomy will come under which class? This questions can be asked in exam, class 2. Cholecystectomy. Cholecystectomy comes under, suppose laparoscopic cholecystectomy comes under which class of wound? Lap coli. I am very specific, lap coli. So, lap coli will come under class 2, clean contaminated, where you can read through that. Respiratory, alimentary or genitary or urinary tracts are entered. So, alimentary tract for CBD and cystic duct is entered. So, it will come under clean contaminated, right. And class 3 is contaminated, open, fresh or accidental wounds, operations with major breaks in sterile techniques. Example, open cardiac massage or gross spillage from gastrointestinal tract. Incision in acute or non-purulent inflammation is encountered. Suppose, 
if you say ileal perforation, we will come under which, which category? Ileal perforation, intestinal perforation. See, purulent will be colonic, there will be four. Small intestine like duodenal, all those will come under class 3. class 3. Okay. So, you will have to have this table for you for sure short question. Again, the class of shocks they will ask you. Classification of shocks. Perforator appendix will come under class 3. Appendicectomy will come under class 2. Okay. Because perforator appendix will have spillage. When you do a controlled when you do a controlled, then it is class 2. Open up and set me for unperforated will be class 2. Perforated will be class 3. Perforated class 3 surgery is done for appendix. Unperforated, it is class 2 appendicectomy done. Okay, you tell me what is the most common organism encountered in acute unperforated appendicitis? The answer is sterile. So, this is exam question and most of the students will answer is E. coli. My question was acute appendicitis unperforated. The most common organism is sterile, nil, zero. The most common organism in a perforated appendicitis is E. coli, followed by bacteroides, followed by peptostreptococcus, aerobic and anaerobic. Is it clear? Are you able to understand what I am saying? Unperforated sterile, unperforated acute appendicitis, sterile peritoneal cavity is sterile. In a perforated appendicitis, it is E. coli, perforated appendix. Now, class 3 means it is self explanatory open or fresh accidental wounds operation with the major breakthrough in a sterile technique, gross spillage. Suppose you do a resection anastomosis or there is a injury, penetrating injury to the intestine, bullet shot injury to the intestine, second line of this. Huh? See, difference between perforation of this and this is, I can tell you in simple words, this is a infection, dirty wound, it is like a fecal, cross fecal contamination, like a pelvic abscess, like a fecal protonitis. Yes, like a colonic perforation, you have that in the mind. This is like a small intestinal perforation, class 3. You just imagine like a small intestinal perforation, okay, where there is spillage, but not as contaminated as class 4, okay. Why human bite has to, because human bite has to happen on the surface, right? Appendicectomy perforated class 3 or else it is class 2. Unperforated class 2, perforated class 3. Most common organism in perforated is E. coli followed by bacteroides followed by peptostreptococcus. See, gross spillage, they have not said as a fecal spillage, it can be bile. Yes. So, it does not mean that way. It is contaminated. Obviously, it is contaminated because small intestine has mix of things. It has fecal material also. I am not saying no. That is why you understand grossly like a small intestine perforation class 3, large intestine perforation is class 4. This is a simple way for you to understand. Sequel perforation class 4, gunshot wound, colonic perforation, sigmoid valvulus class 4 perforation. Diverticular perforation class 4, vaginal surgery will come under clean wound in case no tracts are involved, no ureteric injury is involved, no rectal injury is involved, split skin grafting, that is a clean wound, SSG is a clean wound. What is a child turcot pukes CTP class of patients of bilirubin 50 millimoles per liter, albumin 35 grams per liter, INR 1.89 not associated with ascites or encephalopathy. Now, you tell me the parameters. So, bilirubin, let me check your memory, 
50 milli moles. How many points? You want to see the tables once? So, albumin 35 grams, INR 1.89. So, you need to tell me the points and no ascites and no encephalopathy. So, once you assign the points, then you will know. Okay, I will show you the table. Once you see the table, let me know. 50, so you have 2 points and bilirubin more than 35.1, INR 1.7 to 2.2 .2 is 2 points and no ascites, no encephalopathy, 1 point each. So, now you fill in. So, 30 will be 2 points, this will be 1, this will be 2, this will be 1, count. So, it is totally 6 and uh, it will be 8. So, the total will be 8. So, child Turcotte puke score, scoring system, look into the liver function, hepatocellular function in cirrhosis. So, the components are bilirubin, albumin, ascites, encephalopathy and INR. So, bilirubin less than 34, 1 point 34 to 50 and more than 50, albumin more than 35, 25 to 35, less than 25, ascites none, easily controlled, poorly controlled, encephalopathy none, grade 1 or 2 or grade 3 or 4 and INR less than 1.7, 1.7 to 2.2, .2, more than 2.2. .2. For all the differences of opinion between Sebastian and Bailey and Love, follow Bailey and Love, 20th iteration. Okay. If there is a difference of opinion between Schwartz and Sebastian, follow Sebastian. So, first priority will go for Bailey 20th iteration, second Sebastian, third Schwartz. So, A, Childs A is 5 to 6 points, Childs B, 7 to 9 points and Childs C, 10 to 15 points. So, the right answer will be child's P because it is 7 to 9. So, the answer here is 8. So, this is what uh, we got into it appropriately. Okay. Now, child's A, child's B, child's C. What is the management for child's A? Patient comes with poor hypertension, massive upper GI bleed. That's what I said, follow what is given Bailey. Suppose a patient with a portal hypertension, upper GI bleed, massive, varicell bleeding. What do you do for child's A? What do you do for child's B? Quick answers, please. These are straight questions which are asked in your exams. Child's A, what is the treatment of choice? Either you manage by endoscopic, endoscopic, fails, tips, fails, shunt procedures. Childs B and C transplant and few patients of child B can migrate to this also, but predominantly go for transplant. Okay. Now, my question here is, what is the age limit for liver transplant? Question, potential questions were asked previously, age limit. What is the upper age limit? So, there is no age limit. What is the criteria, one criteria for liver transplant? The criteria or as the criteria for liver transplant. MELD score is a waiting list score. Millen criteria that is used for an hepatocellular cancer. A patient is suffering with hepatocellular cancer, can he have a transplant or not is Millen's. Do not uh, try to confuse me. Eh? You can't. Milled score is a patient desired for a transplant and is a waiting list. Model for end stage liver disease. I am asking what is the cause, what is the criteria to do it? I am saying that is a desired factor. We will say end stage liver disease of any cause. The question here is, what is the most common cause of end stage liver disease? 
when we say the most important criteria for liver transplant is end stage liver disease of a any cause, when we say any cause, what is the most common cause of end stage liver disease? That points as very, very, very important. Okay, fine. End stage liver disease, cirrhosis is a cause, correct? Fine. What is the most common cause of cirrhosis? What is the most common cause of cirrhosis? There are many causes, viral, alcohol, aflatoxin B infection, okay, hemochromatosis, Wilson's, yes, so are many, many, many causes. Is it viral or alcoholic? That is the point here. Somebody is saying non-alcoholic state of hepatitis. So, today worldwide, if they ask you in India, it is alcohol. Suppose they always ask worldwide, it is viral. And what is the most common viral disease to cause end stage liver disease? Is hepatitis B or C? Is it hepatitis B or C as a cause? Yes? Yes, please. It answer is hepatitis B. So, this is how you need to learn, understand. Okay. So, they will dig into the system of what they want from you. So, you should know what it means. Okay. It is not on the superficial layer of the skin, the things are there. It is deep inside. The depth is important. So, the most common cause of hepatocellular cancer. See, any form of cirrhosis in the form of chronic liver cell disease is one of the most important risk factor for hepatocellular cancer. Correct? Hello. You understand? So, the question is, the cirrhosis is one of the most important cause as a risk factor for hepatocellular cancer. And what is the most common cause of hepatocellular cancer? Again, the same answer comes. It's a cirrhosis. And a cirrhosis because of hepatitis B or hepatitis C as a cause of hepatocellular cancer in the form of cirrhosis. What's your answer? This is a criteria for liver transplant I asked. Chronic infection with what? Is it B or C? Is it B or is it C? This is a controversial question. This changes every year to year. You know that? Year to year it changes this answer. HCC, cirrhosis, the most common cause. Yes, please. The answer previously it was C. Now the answer is B. Understand it. Previously it was C. It, it was easy to remember. I always used to teach the students this way. What I used to see is HCC, hepatitis C, cirrhosis. This is the way we used to teach. But it has become B. Now the answer is B. Are you able to understand what I am trying to tell you? One last question before we move on to the next question. What is the absolute contraindication to do a liver transplant? Ongoing substance abuse. That is the answer. It is not substance abuse. Ongoing. The word has to be there. When there is an ongoing substance abuse is there, why do you want to do a transplant to him? He is going to again damage the organ. What is the most common ongoing substance abuse that could cause liver damage? Correct. It is obviously alcoholism. Okay. So, ongoing substance abuse of alcoholism is an absolute, single absolute contraindication for liver transplantation. Is it okay? Fine. You are all very good. It is all easy to train you up for the exams. Not a criteria for damage. See, this is again an exam area. Damage control surgery, classification of wounds, types of shock, scoring systems. This is what the AIMS people or NEET SS people will ask. So, these are defined areas that you should not go without preparing. Tell me the answer. The right answer is blood pressure, A to B 90. Why? Because the blood pressure has to be below 70, it is going to be DCS. ETC, early total care and different criteria for DCS. Hypothermia, less than 34. Acidosis, less than PS 7.2. Serum, lactate, more than 5 millimoles per liter. Blood pressure, less than 70 millimoles, millimeters of mercury. Transfusion, approaching 15 units of blood Severity, injury severity score more than 36. This is also an exam question. Injury severity score. 
Criteria for ETC Stable hemodynamics, no need for vasoactive or ionotropic, no hypoxia, no hypercapnia, serum lactate less than 2 millimoles, normal coagulation, normothermia, urine output more than 1 ml per kg per hour. So, early total care is a stable patient. Understand this. Very simple. One word you understand, he will be a stable patient in all perspectives. Finished. That is a criteria for early total care. You need not remember any of this. Any of the stable parameters is for ETC. Any of the unstable parameters, he is in metabolic acidosis, lactate levels are increasing, blood pressure is falling and he needs blood transfusion. And injury rate score shoots more than 36. What more you want? An acidotic hypothermic huh? hypotensive patient is an unstable patient. Criteria for damage control surgery. Is it clear? This is the way you need to remember. So, an unstable patient will go for DCS. So, always a good teacher will teach his subject with only one word. Okay. Only one word to remember that concept. So, stable patient for ETC, unstable patient for DCS. Is it okay? Now, you should know the parameters for sure. Basically, the parameters are measured with pH, whether acidotic or not, whether it is hypotensive or not. Yes. So, what are the levels? Hypothermia. So, all these three are parameters. See, the class of shock was asked. Standard questions. 20 percent. See, this even this word remains the same. See, I have for past five years, two in ESS, one need, almost three exams. Three into five is 15 exams. I am telling you, this question of 20 percent is in almost in 10 exams of class two. And I can tell you class 3 in another 5 exams. But in all 15 exams in last 5 years, this question was there. This question 100 percent was there. I can tell you this. There is no paper which is set which of those this question. I do not know why. Because I am doing this recall for last 5 years and I am seeing in every paper. Probably one paper might have been missed at the most I think I believe so. I am vaguely I am probably one. Or almost out of 14 out of 15 or 15 out of 15 it is there and the same option is also there. Option B will be the answer and 20 percent will be on the head end of the question. So, traditional class see that traditional classification of hemorrhagic shock it is in famous 15 page number 15 20th edition of Bailey and Love. Blood volume loss as per percentage less than 15 percent is class 1, class 2 is 15 to 30 percent and class 3 is 30 to 40 percent and class 4 is more than 40 percent. Is it okay? Now, donating blood will come under which class? Yes, 350 ml, do not make mistakes. Okay, 350 ml of blood will raise hemoglobin by hemoglobin after transfusion will raise by minimum 1 gram percent, 1 gram minimum. Okay. Now, 350 ml understood. Hemoglobin above what level is a contraindication to donate? Hemoglobin more than, not less than I am asking. Is there any contraindication not to donate more than this value? Is there any contraindication? You said 8. See, that is what is very important. Before you understand the question, do not answer. Do not preclude that this is what I am going to ask you. You thought I am going to ask you what is the lowest value of hemoglobin you are not supposed to do a get up donation of blood. That is the reason why you put 8. Correct? This will happen in the exam also. Just reading first two lines or one line part of the question, you come to some conclusion and keep answering it. Do not do that. Understand what they are asking. Examiners are very smart nowadays because examiners are young today. They are not like those days. Very, very young. They are as smart as you. Understand you are three years later, how you will be the same as the examiners today. Understand that. Hemoglobin above what I will defer getting blood from M. What is the cutoff value? The answer is above 17. Polycythemia has to be ruled out. So, 17 is the value, has to be investigated and we have to defer. 
Is it okay? What is massive blood transfusion? What is the meaning of massive blood transfusion means what to you? More than how many number of units you covered is a massive blood transfusion. See generally below 10 they do not take but uh, below 8 100 percent not advisable. Massive blood transfusion as per definition means what? How many units equal to blood volume? Correct, equal to blood volume, understood. Then what is equal to blood volume? Replacing half of blood volume. More than 4 in 1 hour or more than 10 in 24 hours. Correct. Replacing more than half. Correct. If it is the entire blood volume, it becomes exchange transfusion. Complete transfusion. So, in the form of units, they will ask you is it 6 units or 8 units or 10 units or 12 units? This is one of the questions which was asked in the exam. So, among these three options, which one you answer? In 24 hours only. In 24 hours, what do you define by massive blood transfusion? I have given you four options, correct. More than 10 units in 24 hours. What is the most common metabolic complication? What is the most common metabolic complication of massive blood transfusion? This is a standard interest exam question which revolves around the question which we are discussing now. There is an electrolyte abnormality. I did not ask you electrolyte abnormality. I asked you metabolic complication. You are talking about electrolyte. It can be combined also. Metabolic acidosis. Okay. And uh, whether the electrolyte depends on chelated, non chelated, there are a lot of multiple factors to know it. And uh, metabolic acidosis is the right answer. Okay. Very clear. Which of the following is the contraindication for sentinel lymph node biopsy? Except. So, you made as a T3 as an answer. Correct. Why? Contraindication should be for? In case it is for staging, should have been for? What? T4. Now, what is the indication for central infrared biopsy? We ask you this question. What is the indication for central infrared biopsy? Correct. Primary biopsy proven, node clinically negative. Node clinically negative, but biopsy proven primary. Correct. So, you give peritumoral injection of methylene blue or radioisotope where it gets on the peritumoral region and it gets drained to the respective drainage lymph nodes and when you take a biopsy of the representation of those lymph nodes and you look for the involvement of the malignancy of these nodes from the primary tumor is suspected. If it is not there, so the axillary lymph nodes are clinically negative and microscopically negative. Suppose if it is positive, then central lymph node biopsy is positive. That means clinically negative but microscopically positive. Correct. Now, what is most common central lymph node involved in breast cancer? An exam will ask you most common sentinel lymph node involved in breast cancer. Yes, answer is yes, anterior group of lymph node or otherwise called what is the other name for that? Pectoral group. You do not say level 1 <laughs> because level 1 has anterior, posterior and lateral okay? and pectoral is 1 of level 1. Okay? With respect to pectoral is minor, those lateral to pectoral is minor level 1, those behind central group of lymph nodes are level 2 and those medial or above pectoral is minor is level 3. Understood? Now, patties does it have level 2 dissection or level 3 dissection? Patties MRM, when you say that, the next question automatically comes MRM by patty. Is level 2 dissection or level 3 dissection? MRM patty is level 3 dissection. Is spectral is minor preserved or removed? Is it preserved or removed? So, level 3 dissection, 
spectral is minor removed. Understood? Fantastic. What is the most common nerve injured? Most common nerve injured. Related question in this area in central node biopsy. Now, when you say the most common lymph nodes that are involved are a pectoral group of lymph nodes, then how intercostal brachial lymph node can be involved? See, in axillary dissection, see, there are three nerves could be injured. Intercostal brachial nerve, nerve latissimus tarsi, I am sorry, serratus anterior, that is long thoracic nerve of bell and one more is nerve to latissimus tarsi. These are the three nerves which are encountered and can be involved in axillary dissection, right. But in the central lymph node biopsy, the question here is not axillary dissection. I did not ask you a question which nerve is most commonly injured in axillary dissection. My question was which nerve is most commonly involved in central lymph node biopsy. There are two different questions here. Central lymph node biopsy and axillary dissection are not the same. Is the axillary dissection central lymph node biopsy are same? Different. Then you tell me the answer for this. You are given an answer for axillary dissection, not central lymph node biopsy, S L N B. Then what is the answer here? Three nerves to be preserved there. In that intercostal brachial nerve is one of the most commonly involved now, injured now. There is no doubt about it. The nerve that is very close to this lateral pectoral nerve. In central lymph node biopsy, the anterior group of lymph nodes are most commonly around the lateral thoracic artery and the nerve that is closely associated with the lateral pectoral nerve. Central lymph node biopsy is contraindicated in inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is the play I am telling you. Every class is a play and it is fun. You enjoy it and I will trick you in every place. I know where will you go wrong. I know. I have gone through your face. I know what do you think. What do you, when I ask a question, what will come to your mind? Where you will go wrong? The game will start from next week, full fledged, one of the frequency sets. Inflammatory breast cancer, T4 disease, or history of previous you, breast or chest, chest surgery and breast scarring, burns or radiotherapy. Concept based on is only one folder, na? where there is two folder, only one folder is there. What's two prognosis? Breast cancer is worst two prognosis. See, all those folders which are on display are recent. Those folders which are there on e-library are old. Finished, simple. Na? So, worst two prognosis is inflammatory. Best two prognosis. And the classes which are on live, right which is going on are peroperative or intraoperative. Ductal carcinoma, there are n number of ductal carcinomas. Ductal carcinoma not otherwise specified. Ductal carcinoma in situ. Medullary is also type of ductal cancer. Mucinous is also type of ductal cancer. Tubular is also type of ductal cancer. What is the most common type of breast cancer? Most common type of breast cancer. Let us check on the basics. How far you are strong? Let me check. Ductal carcinoma invasive, not otherwise specified, is the most common. Next to most common, lobular carcinoma in situ or invasive? Correct. It should be very specific. When you say lobular, say lobular carcinoma invasive. Lobular carcinoma invasive. Understood? So, best prognosis is for? Is it medullary? or tubular. Both are good only. Which is number one good? See, both are best. Which is number one best? Number one will be tubular, number two will be medullary. In closure of laparotomy while closing all through which layer is spared? Mass closure. This is something like a spontaneous rupture of the abdomen. The classical sign of abdominal rupture is zero sanguinous discharge. The average post operative period is 5 to 7. The right answer is skin. Layer versus mass closure of the abdomen. Abdominal wounds can be closed either by closing all layers of the abdomen, musculo aponeurotico layers avoiding the skin. 
very important. Together or by closing individual layers of the rectus sheath. An alternative wound, alternate would be an approximate only the anterior rectus sheath in a situation where mass closure is not feasible. Continuous versus interrupted is not asked here. So, the skin is spared. So, do not just be think of what you do in your clinic. What is given in the book is important. Understood? What you do in your theatre could be your protocol in your unit and the hospital. Okay. So, the right answer is skin. There are many wards, many theatre, you know, they close along with the skin. That is the reason why you answered that. Okay. I am not finding it very odd. I know what you would have done in your mind, you would have thought what you have done in your theatre and answered here. But you should also read in Bailey 20th edition, his new edition is released. So, you will also have some say. Page number 109. Have it in your mind. First line of management of patients presented with a hydrofluoric acid bond. The right answer is calcium gluconate gel. One acid that is common cause of acid burns in hydrofluoric acid, although generally a weak acid, it chelates calcium and magnesium in tissues. Burns affecting the fingers and caused by dilute acid. Or relatively common, the initial management, this is what is asked, these are words from Bailey and Love. The initial management is with calcium gluconate gel topically. However, severe burns or burns to the larger areas of the hand can be subsequently treated with bias block as an axillary block containing calcium gluconate gel 10 percent. If patient has been burnt with a concentration greater than 50 percent, treat of hypocalcemia and subsequent arrhythmia then becomes high and this is an indication for acute early excision. It is best not to split skin graft this hydrofluoric acid wounds initially, but to do this it is at a delayed stage. Okay, so, the right answer is what? It is very, very simple and straightforward calcium gluconate gel. An abscess involving the deep incision is found on contrast and density of the abdomen the type of surgical site infection. Now, this table has got some importance starting now from last two years and we have got almost one repeat on this previously also. What is the answer here? The right answer is option B, deep surgical site infection. Now, I will go through this deep incision of surgical site infection. Okay. Infection occurs within 30 days of postoperative procedure if no implant is left in place or within one year of if implant is in place. The infection appears to be related to the operative procedure and involves the deep soft tissue, example facial and muscle layers. Now, the incision and the patient has at least one of the following. Number one, purulent drainage from the deep incision, but not from the organ space or compartment of the surgical site. Deep incision spontaneously dehiscence or deliberately opened by a surgeon and is culture positive and are not cultured when the patient has at least one of the following signs and symptoms, fever more than 38 degrees centigrade or localized pain or tenderness and a culture negative finding does not meet this criteria. An abscess or other evidences of infection involving deep incision is found on the direct examination during the reoperation okay, or by histopathological or radiological examination. Diagnosis of a deep incisional SSI by surgeon or attending physician, this is what is asked in the question. Wound there has been both superficial or deep incision infection is classified as DIS. So, there is a superficial incision SSI infection occurring within 30 days and organs on space SSI infection occurs within 30 days after a operative procedure of implant. There are some criteria that are given. I, can, I think you can go through it with your time and space for this question. Okay. The distribution of questions, the maximum number of questions is for gastro surgery. The number of questions approximately of 150, this will have 50 questions. Okay. Number 2 is urology. This will have almost close to 15 questions. And the next comes the breast and endocrine. This will have another 15 questions. Then comes about head and neck and salivary glands and, and parathyroid okay, and malignancies, oncology. This will have somewhere close to 8 to 10 questions. 
and the next important part other than this is about rest of the specialty surgeries vascular neuro surgery plastic surgery onco surgery ctvs and vascular this will have all specialties will range from 5 to 10 questions each biostatistics will have 3 to 5 questions so this is the approximate number of distribution of questions pediatric surgery will be part of all those organs they don't be asked separately even if they are separately pediatric surgery you can add along with that for another 5 questions it will be asked along with this specialty so i didn't put separately and general surgery also general topics like burns suture materials and all those will again nutrition all this will be three to five questions so this is how it is been distributed the most important areas to be covered this area which forms the bulk and rest all the specialties five to ten questions okay predominant blood supply to parathyroid gland the right answer is inferior thyroid artery now what are the related questions to this related questions are when you look into the thyroid gland now parathyroid glands located posterior laterally two pairs and the supply from above superior thyroid artery from below inferior thyroid artery and the nerve that is closely associated correct external laryngeal nerve external laryngeal nerve and their association with external laryngeal nerve they will be close to it proximally and away from the gland it is little wider so you will tie the superior thyroid artery close to the gland it becomes a long pedicle the nerve that is closely associated with inferior thyroid artery is the basics are very very important recurrent laryngeal nerve as this nerve is closely associated with inferior thyroid artery you will tie the inferior thyroid artery away well away from the gland okay to prevent the injury of either now external laryngeal nerve supplies which muscle injury to external laryngeal nerve causes what yes as it supplies cricothyroid the function of cricothyroid is tensor correct so it's a tensor of the vocal cord so loss of high pitch especially loss of high pitch tone will be the complication and recurrent laryngeal nerve injury unilateral what is the cause what is the presentation loss of high pitch tone unilateral so injury can cause hoarseness of voice on vocal cords because all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are supplied by recurrent laryngeal nerve except for cricothyroid which is supplied by external laryngeal nerve very clear so all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except cricothyroid is supplied by external laryngeal nerve very clear now unilateral injury to recurrent laryngeal nerve what is the presentation other than hoarseness on vocal cords they can be asymptomatic because of the compensatory effect of the other cord if it is bilateral injury of rln they can cause strider and inspiratory strider okay now all of you know that quickly the development of superior parathyroid gland is from most of the time student will go wrong in basics fourth what it is from the pouch 
pharyngeal pouch. There is a difference between the arch and the pouch. Now, inferior develops from third pouch, pharyngeal pouch. Okay. Now, what are the pathologies in parathyroid gland? Okay. Parathyroid adenoma, hyperplasia and carcinoma. Correct. So, adenoma, hyperplasia, carcinoma. Of the three pathologies, which is the most common? Among these three pathologies, which is the most common? Is it adenoma or hyperplasia or carcinoma? The adenoma is one of the most common pathology that you should know. Hyperplasia is most commonly associated with what? Men's syndrome. So, men's syndrome is associated with hyperplasia. So, parathyroid adenoma is one of the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism. This is the exam question. They will ask you this. The other way of asking you this question about the pathology is the most common cause. So, what they can ask you? The most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism is parathyroid adenoma. Is it okay? Clear? Now, the next question automatically comes to you is, is it more commonly seen in superior parathyroid gland or inferior parathyroid gland? If you say adenoma is the most common cause of primary hyperparathyroidism as a pathology in the parathyroid gland, is it most commonly seen in superior or inferior? So, most commonly seen with inferior gland, correct? Inferior. Now, ectopic locations can be seen for both. Yes, ectopic locations are seen for both. Superior gland can also be ectopic, inferior gland can also be ectopic. This ectopic question is a repeat for every exam, almost every exam. Now, what is the most common ectopic location for superior parathyroid? The ectopic site for superior is posterior mediastinum. Where in posterior mediastinum? See, entrance exam is not how much you study, it is how you study. How deep and dig you can have a clear concept and facts with you, that is very important. And that too, superficiality is a lot of joy. They ask good questions and standardized questions, where there is a satisfaction in answering and there is a satisfaction for preparation also. Okay, the right answer is IOTO pulmonary window. Is it okay? So, the most common location posterior mediastinum is IOTO pulmonary window. For the inferior parathyroid gland, it will be in the anterior mediastinum in the thyrothymic ligament of the tract or even within the thymus also sometimes. Thyrothymic ligament. So, what I am trying to tell you is the pathology is more common with inferior parathyroid gland. Ectopic location is also more common with inferior parathyroid gland. Okay. Now, when you see into the blood supply of thyroid, we said superior thyroid artery, inferior thyroid artery and uh, arteria thyroid ema from arch of aorta, atria thyroida ema, right. Now, the most common location for inferior parathyroid gland is the anterior mediastinum within the thyrothymic ligament or within the thymus, okay. Most common cause of respiratory distress following thyroidectomy. What is the answer? Laryngeal edema. The most common cause of laryngeal edema. Tension hematoma. The most common cause of tension hematoma, slippage of ligature from superior thyroid artery pedicle. Why the slippage has to happen? Why not inferior thyroid artery slippage? 
superior artery and inferior artery are ligated by the same surgeon and with the same material. Why superior artery slippage is more common than inferior artery? It is the direct and the first branch, so what? It is the first branch of external carotid artery. It is a first branch that we remember, okay. With a long pedicle, you tie close to the gland because to avoid the external laryngeal nerve injury. Sister is a superior artery, Louis is a lingual artery, powder is a posterior auricular artery, face is the facial artery, yes, often is occipital artery, attracts is ascending pharyngeal artery, medical is a maxillary artery, students is a superficial temporal artery, correct. So, sister Louis powder face often attracts medical students. So, this is about the branches of external carotid artery of the first branch is the superior artery, is the long pedicle, is the ligation of that. So, chance of slippage is very high. Inferior artery is mostly today is ligation continuity. What is that? Inferior artery is in ligation continuity. So, the chance of slippage is less and once superior artery is normal, then you should look for middle thyroid vein where it could be encountered of the bleeding. Then immediately you need to remove the skin sutures remove the skin sutures and uh, give steroids and uh, you will shift the patient to OT and uh, intubate the patient and you will go ahead with ligation of the bleeding vessel. So, this is very, very important bleeding vessel. So, here this is a question for you for superior artery and for this here the question is inferior artery, okay. So, the maximum blood supply to parathyroid gland is from inferior thyroid artery. Now, the next question that is related to this is, now most common cause of hypocalcemia in immediate post period, we will just finish this also. Most common cause of hypocalcemia in immediate post operative period, immediate same day, immediate. The right answer is what Starr said, hungry bone syndrome. It is a relative hypocalcemia because if this patient would have suffered from abnormal calcium metabolism because of hyperthyroidism or whatever might be the cause, where there would have been a demineralization of the bone. Once the primary pathology is corrected, so what would have happened is there would be the bone will take back the calcium which was lost. So, there will be a relative dip in the calcium at the serological level. So, blood calcium will be less. So, this is called hungry bone syndrome that is the most common cause in day 1, day 1. Now, all of you were telling me that it is a hypoparathyroidism could be a cause. Yes. It could be a cause, no doubt about it. Hypo para thyroidism. Hypo para thyroidism as a cause of hypocalcemia. Which post operative day you will expect? This is the exam question. This is a repeat question in exam. You can get it in any exam. Which post operative day you will encounter this? So, you will see hypocalcemia as a cause of hypoparathyroidism, you will be seen in second to fifth POD. Now, the question is this, what is the most common reason for hypoparathyroidism in postoperative period following thyroidectomy? Because today we are in parathyroid preserving, right? We do not remove parathyroid glands unless it is going to be total. So, it is going to be vascular insufficiency, vascular insufficiency as the most important cause ischemia, vascular insufficiency as a cause, as an important cause and the most important is inferior thyroid artery, pedicle. So, inferior thyroid artery, pedicle. This is the reason why today we practice called ligation continuity. We do not tie the main pedicle. So, we tie only those that supplies the thyroid gland and preserve those branches of inferior thyroid artery that supplies the parathyroid gland. Is it okay? Have you all understood? So, 
what is the immediate management of hypercalcemia of any cause? It would be parathyroidinsufficiency or hungry bone syndrome, but a symptomatic hypercalcemia, how it will be treated? 10 ml, 10 percent, IV, calcium, gluconate over 10 minutes. So, this is the rule, okay. So, you should understand this way. 10 percent, 10 ml, IV calcium gluconate over 10 minutes. Is it okay? All of you have learned. Then followed the stabilization, you can start with oral calcium and vitamin D. So, these are the things which encompasses around the inferior thyroid artery for your exams. Inferior thyroid artery is a branch of, superior thyroid artery is an external carotid artery. Inferior thyroid artery is a branch of, correct, thyro cervical trunk. Thyro cervical trunk has how many parts? You want to be a good surgeon, you should be a good anatomist. Understand that. You can't just go on top that say I am a great surgeon without knowing anatomy. Yes, it has three parts. It is divided into three parts with respect to which muscle. What is a muscle that divides the subclavian artery into three parts? Correct. Pectoral is minor, teeth is minor, sclerosis anterior. Which one is the answer? Is teeth is minor or pectoral is minor or sclerosis anterior? Which one you want to choose? So, the right answer is scalenous anterior. So, subclavian artery is divided into three parts with respect to scalenous anterior where thyrocervical trunk is a branch of first part of subclavian artery. Understood? The compression of scalenous anterior muscle on the subclavian artery is called scalenous antica syndrome. What is the name of it? Scalenous antica syndrome. The scalenous antica syndrome is one of the most important differential diagnosis of? Correct. It is a thoracic outlet. It is one of the component of thoracic outlet syndrome as one of the differential diagnosis of cervical rib, cervical rib and thoracic outlet syndrome, correct, perfect. And the nerve that is involved is C A T 1 and the artery is subclavian artery in a cervical rib and thoracic outlet syndrome in all the places, see in any place in, in the vascular case, whenever there is a block, suppose there is a block, the proximal vessel get dilated, right. Anywhere the rule is this. Proximal to the block, dilatation will happen if there is a block. But only in when you see the cervical rib, you will see a post nodic dilatation. What do you will see? Post nodic dilatation because of the turbulence of the blood flow. There are only two places in the body that you see post nodic dilatation one in the cervical rib. The subclavian artery as it elevates to the angle to come out from the thorax and the turbulence of blood flow causes post nodic dilatation where thrombus can get formed here and a later date it can break and form embolus. Thromboembolic manifestation because of post nodic dilatation of subclavian artery in the cervical rib. The treatment of choice for cervical rib is extra periosteal excision of the rib. So, there is a different story. Now, where else you get a post nodic dilatation? Coarctation of aorta, correct. You will see in coarctation of aorta, fantastic. And one more place where you get other than coarctation of aorta. So, should I give you? So, the right answer for this is median arcuate ligament syndrome. Have you heard of this? Lateral arcuate ligament, medial arcuate ligament. On this side, lateral arcuate ligament, medial arcuate ligament. And both medial arcuate ligament forms a median arcuate ligament. So, this is the median arcuate ligament. What is this? Where do you see all this? So, this is the lateral arcuate ligament, this is the medial arcuate ligament, this is the median arcuate ligament. Okay. So, this is the inferior surface of the diaphragm. Understood? So, where you see the IVC, esophagus, have you heard of this? T8, T10, then T12, body of T12. And what is there inside? 
iota and at t12 see there are three ventral branches of iota what are the three ventral branches of iota celiac axis superior mesenteric artery inferior mesenteric artery these are the three ventral branches on top of arch of iota, you have artery at the right edema and the bifurcation of iota right in between get the median sacral artery. What is that? Median sacral artery and the rest of all the lateral branches, the renal arteries, the lumbar arteries, the phrenics, correct? All the lateral, intercostal, all these are lateral branches, okay? I just repeat this. So, the ventral branches are celiac axis, superior mesenteric artery, celiac axis T12, superior mesenteric artery L1, inferior mesenteric artery L3. Yes, and the arch gives straight arteria thyroid edema straight to the thyroid and the bifurcation of the iota at the Atkinson between the L3 and L4 where it gives right at the bifurcation gives the median sacral artery. Apart from this list of all or lateral branches. Am I clear? So, that branch which comes at the level of T12 from the iota celiac axis when that is getting compressed with a median arcuate ligament, it is called median arcuate ligament compression syndrome. It compresses the celiac axis. Once the celiac axis gets compressed, okay. So, suppose this is the iota, this is the iota. When the celiac artery gets compressed at this level, okay, now you get a dilatation following this celiac axis beyond the compression because there is a retrograde flow of blood from the superior mesenteric artery because of the rich anastomosis, because of the rich anastomosis, because celiac axis gives left gastric, it gives splenic artery, it gives common hepatic and that gives gastroduodenal, gives right gastroepiploic and the gastroduodenal also gives superior pancreatic duodenal, correct. This superior pancreatic duodenal anastomosis with the inferior pancreatic duodenal, where the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery is a branch of superior mesenteric artery. Then what happens beyond the level of compression, the blood that goes to the superior mesenteric artery flows through inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, that internal anastomosis of superior pancreatic duodenal artery, the reverse of blood flows goes to the gastrodunal, from gastrodunal to the celiac axis, this will do the obstruction. So, you get a post trunk dilatation. So, this is between the collateral circulation that happens in the anterior and the posterior border aspects of the pancreas. Understood? So, Three places where you get a post nodic dilatation to all entrance exam questions. Coarctation with the notching of the ribs, then cervical rib, thoracic outlet syndrome. Next is the median arcuate ligament syndrome. So, I think we have done enough around this area. Can we move? See, surgery is such a beautiful subject. It is a subject we should, someone should not force. I mean, how there is a pleasure in operating a patient? Yes. There is the same pleasure in learning also. So, it has to be equal and it is not that I have to do this way, that way, nothing. You just analyze and you just put anatomy in place. That is very important. Without knowing anatomy, you know some technique and something and <laughs> I mean that is not good. So, you need to learn more anatomy, understand this. If you are a good anatomist, you are a good surgeon. That there ends the chapter. The basics are very important. You should know what structure where. You ask me any anatomy to me right now, I can tell you. Head to foot, you ask me. Anything that you want, layer by layer, I can tell you. Because I love anatomy. That is the reason I become a surgeon. And the specialization can be different. One's personality will decide. I wanted the maximum adrenaline on my throat. I mean, I have an emergency after this. I have a case. So, I feel good on having more thrill on and surgical aspects and I mean those events could create then I thought cardiothoracic gives me the maximum pleasure in surgery then I want to take one other way because we could arrest the heart and diastole we do the repair and bring, bring back and it is day every day is a challenge I mean love this field. Similarly everyone has some passion for a field where they have been impressed that suits their personality. So, you will live in that. So, you need to enjoy thoroughly. See, that is what I am trying to tell you in this initial classes. I am supposed to take you away actually yesterday and today. But even before that, I just want to give you the overview of surgery. So, you need to understand how, what are you going to do from the rest of the classes. So, that you should like first. And then you should also like, I mean, this way of um, approach and this way of doing it. So, then it becomes easy for you to follow the rest of the classes. Correct? Come on, let us go on.
one question which was asked is about the weight of the parathyroid gland. See, spherical or bean shaped, normal parathyroid glands are oval. See, this is given submission like this. See, normal parathyroid glands are oval. Page number 923. Spherical or bean shaped. They vary in color, yellow tan to reddish brown. See, reddish brown. On average, 5 into 3 into 2 millimeter in size and weighs 35 to 40 grams. The weight they asked in one exam. So, you should know this. So, we said the inferior thyroid gland, inferior thyroid artery is one of the predominant vascular blood supply. See that? Predominant vascular supply. For both superior and inferior parathyroid glands, only 80 percent of cases. Predominant means what? 80 percent. Yeah, it, it is a recall for you to know what are the areas they are asking. That is the very first class I am doing it. Okay. See the predominant blood supply. So, the predominant vascular supply. Okay. So, first you know where they ask, what they ask and based on it you start your preparation. Okay. Go to a battlefield knowing the field. Not included in WHO surgical checklist. See, the AIMS people will be on lot of protocols. The question, ESS people, that is the AIMS people, they allow the protocols, scoring systems. So, questions will be based out of it. The right answer is oxygen saturation. Surgical checklist, surgical safety checklist, it is given in page number 214 in 21st edition of Subistan. Okay. So, before induction of anesthesia, I will go through this because questions will be repeated from this area. Has the patient confirmed his or her identity, site, procedure and the concern? Number 2, is the site marked? Number 3, is anesthesia machine or medication check complete? Number 4, is the pulse oximeter on the patient and functioning? Does the patient have a known allergy, difficulty airway or aspiration risk, risk of more than 500 ml of blood loss, the 7 ml per kg in children. So, this all to be asked. And this is routine protocol sister and in our theatre, we have a routine protocol sister where she will come and read out all this before all of us, the entire team and uh, once we say yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, once it is completed and you can go ahead, then you go ahead. That is how it is. And before skin incision, confirm all the team members have introduced themselves by name and role. Every day in the theater, we have an, a habit that we greet each other eye to eye. We see each and every team member, let it be an anesthetist, let it be a cardiologist, let it be an perfusion technician or could be an ECG technician or could be a sister and uh, OT boy. Whoever it is, we greet each other by saying good morning. The day has to be a great day and a great morning and as well as a great day so that the patient should go safely outside the OT without any complication, especially no death. Now, confirm all the team members. I introduce themselves by name and role. Confirm the patient's name, procedure where the incision will be made. And as an antibiotic prophylaxis been given within last 60 minutes, so there is a question which when you leave, give the antibiotic during surgery. So, this question was an exam question. So, as antibiotic prophylaxis been given within last 60 minutes, that means within one hour, anticipated critical events, surgeon, anesthetist to the nursing team, you should ask and as a residential imaging display. So, you need to have the I mean x-ray board okay, lobby, so that you need CT or whatever the necessary radiological thing has to be displayed. So, during the surgery might require yes to check and cross verify. So, before the patient leaves the operating room, so nurse verbally confirms the name of the procedure, completion of the instrument and sponge count, very very important instrument and the sponge counts and specimen labeling and whether there are any equipment problems to be addressed. And to the surgeon, anesthetist and nurse, what are the key concerns for the recovery and management of the patients? So, the, all these are very important and must know, not only for the exam, in the practice as well, these are very, 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 very important and key factors that you should definitely take into account. Okay. 
so kindly make a note of it. So, the right answer given to this is oxygen saturation. So, you will definitely keep the pulse oximeter ready, but uh, very close call when you compare to the other uh, parameters, this is the answer here. How much fasting period requires for a cow milk before surgery? The right answer is 6 hours. Now, this is given in Subistan page number 213, 21st edition of Subistan. The recommended minimum fasting periods between oral intake and general anesthesia for elective operations, ingested material and minimum fasting period. Clear liquids 2 hours, you can give until 2 hours, breast milk 4 hours, infant formula feeds 6 hours, non-human milk 6 hours, that means what is asked is a cow milk and a light meal 6 hours, fried foods and meat 8 hours plus. Very important, this is a area gets repeated often, this is not something new which has been asked earlier also. So, even before you start doing the content in the app, we have loaded the recall sessions okay, over period of exams and this will also get loaded in that. So, kindly have a look at it so that you will know, you know what they are asking, what they are trying to ask so that your preparation will be based on that. Even our teaching is also based out of it, though we cover length and breadth of it, but a lot of emphasis is given to this area and around this area. Calculate the sodium deficit for a patient with a 50 kg male with a sodium of measured is 123 milli equivalents per liter. So, there is a formula for it, for sodium deficit, calculate sodium deficit. So, 210 milli equivalents per liter, see the sodium deficit, the calculation as given in substance. Sodium deficit is milli equivalents is equal to sodium, though goal, what are the goal and what is the measured sodium into total body water. So, this total body water is weight into 60 percent. So, when you approximate this value, you will get 210 milli equivalents per liter. So, you need to know the formula, then you put those parameters and you get the value. So, it is a simple factual question and uh, there is no discussion required. Free water deficit, sodium by 140 minus 1 in total body water, correct sodium is the sodium plus 0 0.016 into glucose minus 100, serum osmolality 2 into sodium plus 1 by 2.8 plus glucose by 18. Fractional excretion of sodium is sodium in urine plus creatinine plasma by sodium plasma plus creatinine urine. So, this formula has to be by hearted because one question will be asked in institute exam next time also. Today sodium deficit and rest of this parameters a high chances to be repeated. Filigree burns, this is a very straightforward simple question and a factual question. Okay, lightning, filigree burns is the lightning burns. Okay, this is a simple straightforward question and uh, no requ nothing required. Washio flap is used for, again a factual question. Mostly they will ask about Abbey Eslanders flap. Abbey Eslanders flap is the most common question asked. And now, this question, it is about nasal reconstruction and Abbey Islander's flap is for, so for nasal reconstruction, you can see that. So, this is the uh, factual question, or sheer flap. Okay, now, 51 year old female post mastectomy on day 10 present with large seroma at the operated site. What is the management? aspiration because the large seroma is a keyword here. Some collection is okay, but large seroma and that is to on day 10, you cannot leave it, it will get infected. Seroma beneath the skin flap or in the axilla represents the most frequent complication, mastectomy and axillary lymph node dissection reportedly occurring in as many as 30 percent of cases. The closed system of suction drain reduces the incidence of the complication, catheters are retained. In the wound under drainage diminishes up to 30 ml per day. You can ask me, sir, when you can remove the catheter? If it is less than 30 ml per day, you can remove. Okay. The wound infection occurs infrequently after the mastectomy, and the majority are a result of skin flap necrosis. 
cultures of the specimens taken from the infected wound or for aerobic and anaerobic organisms. Debridement and antibiotic therapy are effective management. Moderate to severe hemorrhage in the post-operative period is rare. The best managed with the early wound exploration for control of hemorrhage and re-establishment of closed system, suction system drainage. The incidence of functionally significant lymphedema after a MRM, modified radical mastectomy is approximately 20 percent, but may be as high as 50 to 60 percent when the post-operative radiation is employed. The extensive axillary lymph node dissection, the delivery of radiotherapy, the presence of pathologic lymph node or obesity or predisposing factors. Patients should be referred to the physical therapy at the earliest signs of lymphedema to prevent the progression of later stage. So, the use of individually fitted compressive sleeves and complex uh, deconstructive therapy may be necessary. So, if it is going to be a small collection, you can do a wait and watch, but it is going to be a large seroma, it is better to aspirate because the chance of infections are very high. A patient with the graves, see most of the thyroid, parathyroid, salivary glands and to some extent breast, they are targeted from Schwartz. So, those areas I have covered from in, in general surgery, in concepts in general surgery also those respective books. See, whenever general concepts in general surgery, the reference book I will tell you for, I covered it in the form of theory for you to understand, but this thyroid, parathyroid, salivary glands I cover it and also to extend to a breast, breast has lot of combination of books, cover from Schwartz. When come to urology, I predominantly take it from Bailey and Law, urology. And when it comes to GI, I go with Bailey, all three books. I mean, because all three books were Bailey and Substance predominantly. And that is the main, and rest all a combination of uh, three books. And, but I am telling you the predominant uh, subjects where all it covered from. So, a patient with Graves disease present with the spasm of the upper eyelid revealing the sclera. So, upper sclera seen above the sclerocardial rejection, what is the sign? Correct, it is a dull ripple sign. What is one graph is sign? Lead lag, correct. What is Joffrey's sign? What is Joffrey's sign? Basic question, but still good to know because they ask you question in names. So, if you think it is a basic, why did they ask in any SS? This question, Joffrey's sign. Uh, loss of supraorbital folds, that means supraorbital folds, Joffrey sign, Selwang sign, forehead wrinkles, or absence of forehead wrinkles, correct. Selwang sign, strange look, correct, strange, scary look, okay, fine. Now, I will ask you one more question. Of the four signs, the most specific sign, the most specific sign for Graves. The most specific sign for Graves among the four, the right answer is one graphic sign. This is the most specific sign for Graves. What is Graves triad? What is the triad in Graves? Can you tell me? Goiter, number one, number two, eye signs, then third one. Such a simple question, no? You are finding it difficult to answer. See the happiness in me. That means I am enjoying what you do not know. The same happiness your exam will also have. Hyperthyroidism. Now, sensory neural, you are saying sensory neural deafness. I should also to answer uh, what is there in your idea. Sensory neural deafness, okay, goiter and hypothyroidism. There is a triad, you are mentioning correct only because there is cross firing in your brain. It is cross firing in your brain, you cannot stop it. You are saying some other triad where you get a sensory neural deafness. What is this triad called? This triad is called? I can read through your mind. I am teaching for 22 years. The minimum number of students I would have taught is 3.5 lakh. Correct. I can read and go through your mind. Pendred. Correct. What is Pendred syndrome? Pendred syndrome is this hormonogenetic item. You know that? Or this hormonogenetic item. 
absence of thyroid peroxidase absence of thyroid peroxidase one of the cause of cretinism preventable cause of mental retardation in the exam they can ask you this can you tell me one preventable cause of mental retardation can you tell me the only one preventable cause in the entire medical sciences it is cretinism how you can prevent mental retardation cretinism you know how delayed relaxation of angle reflex is the key to suspect so once you check the cord blood sample and you clinically you see this reflexes are low then immediate replacement of thyroxine has to happen to prevent establishment of mental retardation and cretinism so the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is graves disease understood the most common cause of hypothyroidism the opposite edge of the sword so in india if they ask you you say iron deficiency but if they don't there is no question in in the question there is no india i have never seen in ss there is an india which is asked they ask only general questions and when they ask the most common cause of hypothyroidism is going to be autoimmune and what autoimmune disease you are very very broad that will not work for entrance you have to be very precise this hormonogenetic disorder is wrong correct hashimotos 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 the autoimmune disease of thyroid is the most common cause of hypothyroidism worldwide is it okay which antibody is seen 100% in hashimotos it is not tpo it is not thyroglobulin is it anti mitochondrial or anti microsomal stock sense you come to the point there are only two antibodies that can be directed towards thyroid peroxidase but what are those antibodies there are two antibodies what are the two antibodies anti mitochondrial and anti microsomal yes very specific which is 100% in hashimotos which is 50% in hashimotos correct anti mitochondrial 100% anti microsomal 50% okay why i sign is very important understand this these are the key because t3 t4 is high because the diffuse enlargement of goiter is there i signs is very 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 important because the cross reacting cross reacting antibodies which it cross reacts yes with the thyroid tissue and also to the retrobulbar tissue so it produces yes proptosis of the exothalamus okay and is the if the cross reaction is more and if if the severity is more and it can cause progressive exothalamus it can cause progressive exothalamus and this progressive exothalamus optic nerve damage optic nerve damage and this optic nerve damage can lead to blindness and uh, this blindness is called what what is this entity called this is called malignant exothalamus don't know malignancy but term is called malignant exothalamus now what is the treatment of choice for malignant exothalamus the exam question what is the treatment of choice for malignant exothalamus correct orbital radiotherapy should be very specific not general orbital radiotherapy understood orbital radiotherapy okay fine i think we have done something around this i signs for this question so the idea is any question asked in this area here and around so you will be able to answer appropriately so this is the whole idea so this is taken from schwartz lamb edition but it generally belongs to any book so there is no nothing sp specific about it so we have discussed all about the signs which are the following tumor suppressor gene of thyroid malignancy the answer is p10 see oncogenes tumor suppressors other genetic alterations the question that was asked was tumor suppressors so p10 is there for follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma so protein tyrosine phosphate see this is why where you can go wrong because red is closely associated i am not saying because it is involved in mtc ptc 
and all that. It's an Amko gene. So, the question that is asked was tumor suppressor gene. Is it okay? So, you will learn over a period of time during my classes and other faculty classes that how to understand the question and give appropriate, this is only training can make you smarter, yes, over a period of time and not to be carried away with the options, this is very important. What is red proton cogene? What is red proton cogene? Let me, let me check the depth, what do you know about red, other than it causes PTC and MTC. Red proton cogene encodes for tyrosine kinase receptor in the cytoplasmic membrane. Tyrosine kinase receptor. Tyrosine kinase receptor in the cytoplasmic membrane. And RET is identified, RET ligand is identified as glial cell line derived neurotropic factor. See, anything you handle, you should have in depth knowledge, not superficial knowledge. Superficial knowledge will get you some rank, not a good rank. If you want a good rank, you should work in depth. Understood? Now, when you see RET as a whole, as a broader perspective, I will tell you. Say RET point mutation. What all things genetic alteration can have? Point mutation. Genetic rearrangement. Point mutation will cause medullary thyroid cancer. Rearrangement, genetic rearrangement will cause papillary thyroid cancer. The most common type of thyroid cancer is papillary thyroid cancer. The person is orphan and nuclei is papillary CA. Sauma bodies is papillary CA. Pseudo eosinophilic inclusion bodies, papillary thyroid cancer. Lymph node metastasis, papillary thyroid cancer. Bilateral, intrathyroidal spread, papillary thyroid cancer. Good prognosis, papillary thyroid. Least malignant, Papillary thyroid. Curable cancer, papillary thyroid. Any question for thyroid, the best answer is papillary thyroid. Understood? So, this is about papillary because it is being most common. And the other role, the other thing, red port oncogene is in men's syndrome also. Yes, it is a part of men's syndrome. There is no doubt about it. And uh, we are talking about uh, the worst prognosis of thyroid cancer. The worst prognosis of thyroid cancer is anaplastic cancer, is mostly targeted in your exam. Anaplastic cancer treatment is palliation. Treatment is palliation, anaplastic is a very, very important area. Radial artery flap forearm, how the vascular supply penetrates the fascia. Now, the NESS people have a lot of attraction towards this area. Direct cutaneous, septocutaneous, musculocutaneous, direct subcutaneous. Red role as a point mutation to cause medullary CA associated with pheochromocytoma, with mucocutaneous neuromas, ganglion neuromas. So, the question that was asked was radial artery forearm plug. Subtocutaneous fascia that penetrates the fascia, so it is type B. Temporoparietal facial flap, direct cutaneous vessel that penetrates the fascia. Transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap. It is a musculocutaneous vessel that penetrates the patient's type C. So, radial artery is, is about subtocutaneous, very clear. So, Nahe Mathis classification is very, very, very important. You know where all, all this explanation is taken from? From speed app only. Yes, there is table, subistant based, table based classes, subistant, uh, Bailey table based classes, image based classes, high yield, everything is available in learning app. Yes, whatever you want, you can take it from there. The vascular supply to gastrocnemius flap has one vascular particle. Which type of muscular flap classified by Mathe Nahes? Two questions are asked from the same area. So, the right answer is type 1 Schwartz 
Mathis Nahe, classification muscular flops, type 1, 1 muscular pedicle, gastrocnemius, type 2, dominant and a minor pedicle, Cresilius, type 3, 2 dominant pedicles, rectus abdominis, type 4, segmental pedicle, sartorius, type 5, 1 dominant pedicle with a secondary segmental pedicles, pectoral is major. So, the question that was asked was single muscular pedicle, it is type 1. 31 year old female, 57 kg, came with 21 percent of flame burns. How much of intravenous fluid resuscitation will you give to this patient? See, uh, Parkland formula says 4 ml per kg per percent burns, correct? An American association, recent American association says 2 ml per kg per percent burnt area. Which one you should? Because you calculate down two formulas, two different values will be because it is double the value you will get in Parkland when you come to American recommendation. Because Schwartz is based on American recommendation. Which one you want to calculate? Will you want to calculate on A? That means you should know which is most commonly followed today. Which one is most commonly followed today? So, you will calculate on B. So, it is 2 into 57 into 21, correct? How much we get? So, 57 into 2 is 14, 1, 10, 11, correct? 114 into 21, 4, 1, 1, 2, 8, 2, 2. So, we get almost 4, 9, 3, 2394 ml is calculated and we divide it into first 50 percent in 8 hours time since bonds, rest 50 percent remaining 16 hours time since bonds. So, total becomes 24 hours, it is given, this volume is given, correct? And you should also find out if these options are the same as an exam. Once you do it in Parkland formula, you will get the double the value. That means, how much value you get? 4700 something, right? So, that value is not here only. So, that means it is very clear they are calculated with 2 ml. Am I right? See, once you calculate 4 ml, you do not get options only. For those students who are given this exam, if these are the options which are approximately you can collect, which is nothing more than 4000 in that way, if you see. It, it becomes appropriate, it is calculated on 2, 2 ml. Mirage of formula exists from the calculating fluid needs during the burns resuscitation, suggesting that no one formula benefits all the patient. Most commonly used formula, the Parkland or Baxter formula consists of 3 to 4 ml per kg per percent of burns of ringer lactated, for which half is given during the first 8 hours and remaining half is subsequent 16 hours. The most recent, see that, the most recent American Bones Association consensus formula recommends 2 ml per kg per person burnt area of RL. The tendency towards excess fluid administration with the traditional formula, okay. So, this 2 ml is what is recommended. What is the first line of management in the infant with very Robin sequence? Prone position. So, Robin sequence is defined as a triad of micrognathia, glossoptosis and airway obstruction. The mainly airway obstruction is the problem in Perry Robin syndrome. Cleft palate is present in up to 90 percent of affected patients. Though it is not an obligatory component of the diagnosis, the cause of this condition is not known. But many believe mandibular hyperplasia to be an inciting event. According to this theory, uh, micrognathia, a small jaw, prevents a forward migration of the tongue during the gestational development. Glossoptosis results when the tongue remains flipped dorsally into the obstruction position within the oropharyngeal airway. So, see this. So, the first step. So, let us make it in a red one so that when you revise. So, the same PowerPoint slides which we have drawn which is written will be recorded for your letter reference. So, you need not worry and uh, you will just revise during your revision. You will just use this PowerPoint slides for your revision rather than going through the videos at that point of time. We may not have much time there. The first step in the management is the prone positioning. See how they have asked from which book? Schwartz, 11th edition, 
1993, which utilizes the gravity to bring the mandible and the tongue base forward and elevate the upper airway obstruction. More severely affected babies may require an uh, emergent endotracheal intubation at the time of delivery in order to secure the airway. So, the first step is the prone positioning. See the question. What is the ideal time to operate on cleft lip? And what is the ideal time to operate on cleft palate? Cleft will be 10 weeks, 10 gram hemoglobin percent and the baby is 10 pounds, okay. Cleft palate will be one year to wait for spontaneous closure. So, this is how you need to learn. You cannot just go with uh, some <laughs> vague things. You should go with clear cut idea if to the exam. That means, it is a prepared way of going to the exam. So, this is what they ask this I give you. Yes, it is very clear. There is no time, only 30 seconds will be there to read the question. The minute you read, you need to comprehend and give what they expect. So, you should understand the language of the examiner, what he is asking for. If both are present, first treat the cleft lip, then treat the cleft palate. What is the problem? Why cleft lip to be treated in 10 weeks? Because the suckling reflex, because it is to get feed. You will ask me, sir, what the cleft palate, where it cannot get aspirated through the opening in the hard palate. What happens is the contour of the breast in such a way that once the baby starts feeding, yes, the contour of the breast will go and snugly fit into the defect in the palate. So, the aspiration does not occur. There, is, there are natural things which could happen spontaneously and there is a natural beauty. Yes, God beyond science. So, you have a time to wait. And the exclusive breastfeeding is for? How long is exclusive breastfeeding? 6 months, correct. Which of the following is true about FE1 criteria for lobectomy? Today, it emerges as a very important area for exam. 1.5 liters. So, for every uh, type of lung surgery, what is the expected level? See, greater than 2 liters for pneumonectomy. Greater than 1.5 liter for lobectomy. Okay. So, this two values, pneumonectomy is the removal of the entire lung, lobectomy is either of the lobes. Okay. Right upper lobe, right lower lobe, left upper lobe, left lower lobe. Okay. Great. So, this is about it. What is true about the guidelines for prevention of surgical site infection? Among the following. Correct. Answer is all of the above. All these are the criteria about WHO global guidelines for the prevention of surgical site infection to provide a comprehensive evidence and expert consensus based on recommendations to be applied during pre, intra and post operative to support the health practitioners, highlight in the working teams. So, these guidelines as mentioned which are mostly, yes, which are mostly given as some options. So, the same guidelines and recommendations and uh, will be loaded in the app for you to go through it in detail. So, thereby we come to an end of uh, the questions uh, which could be collected for the CNESS, they said almost 25 questions were asked and the same 25 questions which are taken out and for the discussion here.